Welcome to Metabolic Matters Podcast, where we embark on conversations with thought leaders, disruptors, change agents, and passionate souls. Together, we'll delve into what truly matters to them. And you'll learn how to metabolize this newfound wisdom so you can transform your own metabolic health. Now let's meet today's guest. Hello, everybody. I have such the honor of introducing you to an amazing human being that another amazing human being introduced me to several years back. In fact, before the recording, Beth and I were trying to figure out how long we've been in each other's worlds. And even funnier, when we were uh, touching, touching in before the recording started, of realizing that all the things we were telling each other we were thinking of doing or getting ready to start, we're doing it by golly, both of us, both of our organizations. So it's also a good reflection because sometimes when you're in the midst of it, you forget how much you've actually accomplished, especially when you've decided to boil the ocean. Um, it's hard to see that movement. So it's always great to touch point with you, Beth, because you remind me of where we started, where we are, where we're still going. And so it's a joy to have you, your brilliance, your, your passion and your purpose here with all of us today. Oh, thanks, Nisha. I, I always love catching up with you too, because I feel like we're tracking with each other. You know, we've got these big ambitions and these big changes we want to see happen. And then we sort of ch 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 touch base and check in with each other. And, you know, it's, there's almost like a, an accountability partner there, right? Like, how are you doing on your big goals? Yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. We're like, or maybe we should also just start a support group. <laughs> There's also many a time that it can be really heavy and intense. And especially in the field that you and I, um, you know, work in is around really helping people overcome extremely challenging and even devastating conditions. And so I want folks to understand about you and your history and what we're going to talk about today, which is Gosh, I don't know. How old are your kiddos now? You've got three kids. What are their ages? I've got one in college. Um, <laughs> one is a junior in high school and one is in eighth grade. So. Oh my gosh. So that span, when they were littles, something happened. You observed something happening in your own children, in your own household that I'm curious, like, first of all, what that was and why you as a parent might have noticed things and started asking questions and started getting curious and doing something about it compared to maybe what other people are doing or not doing. So let's just open it up there. Yeah. So the journey for me really began when my oldest child, again, who's in, in college now, was like in her toddler years. And she was doing a lot of things that were concerning to me. Um, but they were the kind of thing that when I walked on, uh, knocked on the door of a conventional medical doctor, whether I, and I knocked on a lot, it was like an allergist, an immunologist, a gastroenterologist, a psychologist. I, I was looking for why does my daughter have this eczema every time she eats certain food? Or why does my daughter have these belly aches and these sensory issues and these behavioral problems and these tantrums? And like, it was like a, a bag of symptoms, like a laundry list of symptoms. But every door that I knocked on, they're like, well, she's fine. This is normal. And there's no diagnosis. And so I think um, I had this very unique experience where I had a child who had no diagnosis, but had a series of symptoms which um, led me to keep looking. Whereas, you know, if I had, if I had gotten a, a diagnosis like, oh, she's got, you know, this mental health condition or she's got this autoimmune condition or whatever it was, I would have stopped and just followed the, you know, what the doctor told me to do from there on out, which okay. I now know that in conventional medicine doesn't do chronic health conditions or, or developmental conditions very well. They do mm -hmm. great with acute stuff, but this is not their territory in terms of helping overcome these things. So right. it was really a, a blessing that I didn't get any diagnosis and I kept knocking on doors. And so finally I had the good fortune of knocking on the door of an integrative physician, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Nancy O'Hara. And um, she treats kids who have all kinds of immune gut, immune brain stuff going on. And um, she was like, yeah, let's do some lab tests. Let's check this out. Like we did some lab tests. We saw some things were out of balance, gut dysbiosis, you know, there's some nutrient deficiencies, like inf inflammation was a little elevated, like there's things that you can see pretty yeah. easy on lab markers and the recommendation was, you know, work on diet, clean up the environment, um, just some really basic, fundamental, foundational human health things. Um, and, you know, we made all those changes. And within nine months, all those symptoms were gone. Every single wow. one. 
And not only that, my second child started having, you know, a set of mysterious symptoms as well. And we nipped that in the bud because she was younger and we sort of turned it around quicker. And the best part of the whole story is I learned about all of the things that were contributing to the symptoms as part of that journey. And I ended up researching and writing a book between my second and third child. And then I had my third child with none of those symptoms because I learned how to prevent that from happening in the first place. So that was my journey. And I think the most you know, that was obviously very inspiring for me to ha- go through the experience of having my child overcome the symptoms. Yeah. Um, and it's almost like her symptoms were like a Venn diagram with all these other symptoms, ADHD and mm-hmm. autism and autoimmune, right? So like I could all of a sudden could relate to these parents who had these diagnoses. And I wanted to tell them, this is reversible. You can do this. Like, don't take that diagnosis as gospel. Like you actually can turn this around. So that really lit a fire under me. But even more than that, was in that journey, I, um, I worked with, you know, an integrative dietitian, a homotoxicologist, I did, you know, some dysfunctional med stuff, holistic stuff, chiropractor, and in the waiting rooms of all those holistic and integrative practitioners, I met other parents. Uh-huh. And I met parents who had kids had autism and autoimmune diseases and life threatening food allergies. And they were telling me in real time that their kids had either already lost those diagnoses or were on their way to. So I think the first one that really popped <laughs> off was learning about autism. I, you know, met a parent whose child had severe autism and she had completely reversed that condition in her child. And I was like, wait a minute, yeah. if this is possible, why is no one telling people this? And that's really what a letter of fire under me because I, you know, it, it can't just be that like, it's reserved for a handful of people who happen to have this little bit of information. Yeah. You know, we yes. need to make that common knowledge and accessible. Um, so that's what I've been doing for the last 15 years is trying to get that information out there. And figure out a way to make us more accessible for people. So huge. It's, you know, you just struck a, a memory with me. You've also met my my dear friend slash sister-in-law slash director of education, Janet Ottersberg, who in her previous job before she took over the directorship of education with the Metabolic Tree Institute of Health, she, her job as an occupational therapist was to <laughs> matriculate four-year-old autistic kids into the LA school district. Mm. And what was part of her impetus to leave was the frustration and the sadness that she knew stories like what you just shared of children who were able to overcome um, something that was told it couldn't be overcome, right? Mm -hmm. By making some of these changes, by being detectives and finding out what was causing that particular child's sort of expression of whatever condition, specifically in that world and the autism world. And she had her hands tied. She was not allowed to speak to anything that was anecdotal. She was not allowed to speak to, hey, have you ever thought about or looked into X, Y, and Z? If she did, she would be reprimanded or even threatened to have her job taken away. And it was so futile to watch more and more families going more and more down the tubes and more and more devastation and more and more layers of diagnoses and more and more layers of medications and more and more pathologies arising from other pathologies that it became too painful for her to stay in what she knew was possible and yet what everyone else refused to talk about or, or consider. So I'm curious for you if you had a similar experience once you did start to realize, wow, there's, there's something that can be done. How were you met with those folks that might either from the medical field or even other parents that were a little bit more resistant to hearing what you had to say? Well, I, um, I wrote a book in 2010 for my pediatrician. I wrote it for my pediatrician because I, I had gone to my pediatrician and said, something's wrong. And they, you know, I kind of, there was like a practice where there was multiple pediatricians. Um, nice. And I had talked to a couple of them and was like, please help me, help me, help me, help me. Like there's something wrong here. And they just sort of patted me on my head and were a little bit condescending. So mm-hmm. when I went out and I solved the problem I, on my own, thanks very much, didn't even need you. Um, <laughs> and I had, and then I um, was in graduate school at the time. So I created this very like academic approach to understanding why there were so many kids that were sick. And mm-hmm. why, and like, what is it in the environment that's making them sick? That was like really the focus. Yes. And um, I, I wrote that so that I could have evidence to talk mm-hmm. to people who were naysayers or didn't believe or were stuck in the system and be like, look, it's right here. It's all in the, documented in the medical literature. Like, all you got to do is read it. Um, mm-hmm. So that was sort of, I was driven that way. I've kind of overcome that. You know, I've kind of gotten a spiritual journey to not really feel like vindictive anymore. <laughs> like, I need to like go back and get my pediatrician and, you know. But, but truly the, you know, the, the impetus was to help people know and understand that maybe what they were trained in medical school, which I didn't go to medical school, the training's incredible. They learned so much there. They had this amazing um, opportunity to help people, but this particular issue with our children 
something mm-hmm. that is is unique to this moment in time. We've never seen so many sick children before. And they didn't learn this in medical school. So all these pediatricians really need to be forgiven because it wasn't part of their training. They're seeing it every day in their practices, but they don't necessarily know what to do with it because it wasn't taught to them. Um, right. Some pediatricians, I think, have um, learned and gone on to get you know extended training. Um, wow. And that has re- allowed them to serve their patients um, in a better way. But I do yeah, I think, think that's a disconnect right now, right? Like we just don't have enough people who are trained to treat this generation of kids who have who have all of these immune, metabolic, neurological problems because of the way we're living in the modern world. But again, you can't blame them. It just is, it is what it is. This is where we are today in this moment in time. Well, I think you speak to that. You know, you don't know what you know until you know. And so it's, there's, there's that piece of, you're right, that's not part of training, but I've also in my own experience of my own healing journey and working with other patients um, along the way in their healing journey, and even stories that you've shared with me in the past of, of even being up against uh, when you do talk to a parent who's dealing with a child, who's got a lot of these challenges, that there's even some resistance there because there's mm-hmm. somehow some possible belief system or the interpretation that there's a blame game happening. And I know that is the furthest Mm -hmm. from what you're trying to convey Mm -hmm. because we don't know. We don't know that we should question what materials we're putting around our children, what what furnishings we're putting our children, exposing our kids to, what um, body care products or Mm -hmm. what, you know, medications or whatever. We're, we're, we, you can't know that until you know that. And unless you've taken, you know, ended up in grad school and taken the initiative and had an inclination to research that Beth has had, you can't know that. And you can't take face value when you're, when your pediatricians don't have this education. So just curious how you meet with those parents that are sort of shutting you down that might be mm, taking offense to when yeah. you try to bring information to their awareness. Yeah, well, one thing that I see parents are commonly confused about in terms of interpreting my message about what's possible for kids is that I'm trying to fix their kids or ask them to fix their kids. Their kids, mm-hmm. their kids are perfect as they are. What is not perfect is the, you know, the, the balance in their body. The balance in their body needs to be addressed. Like things are out of balance in the body, which is what precipitates the symptoms yeah. in the first place, right? So the, the, their, neuro, their neurological system, their nervous system could just be dysregulated. Their, you've got microbiome could be just needing to get back into balance. And so yeah. what I try, I try to explain to parents is that um, the symptoms are there as communication from your child's mm-hmm. body. Right. So especially with autism, where there's a lot of um, discussion around neurodiversity and that, um, you know, these kids are neurodivergent. There's nothing wrong with them. There's neurodivergent. Well, everybody, we're all neurodivergent. We are all different in our, you know, in who we are, in our how we act and our behavior. But when behaviors or symptoms are um, causing suffering for a child, like some of these kids have such severe sensory issues that they are suffering. So can we address the things that are causing the suffering and not change who these kids are? Yes, we can absolutely just get to the bottom and help them thrive and and become, you know, the best version of themselves. The other thing I say to parents when there's resistance is that we have this situation where we have more than half of American kids with a diagnosis because of the culture we live in. And nobody, very few people can escape this culture. It's what we eat. It's like what's on the grocery shelves. It's in the restaurants. It's what's in the air. It's what's in the water. It's in our consumer products. It's how we think about things. It's the pace of our day. You know, it's the electronics, the devices. This is a culture. I mean, I was actually a um, a, a history undergrad and I studied American studies and I spent so much time trying to understand American culture. Wow. It is American culture that is at the root of this chronic illness epidemic. So when you tell somebody that their child is sick because of the way they're living and because of their culture, what are they supposed to do? Which other culture are they gonna go to, right? Like they don't have like a backup culture. Oh like, yeah, this one's toxic. I'm gonna use the other culture I have, right? And so you actually have to be living counterculture. We're gonna like revive that word from the 60s and 70s because people who live you know, truly healthy lives in terms of being in sync with your circadian rhythms and living in um, rhythm with nature and eating whole foods that are mm-hmm. meant to be eaten, not processed, you know, junk foods. I mean, all these things, right? That's counter to how right. most Americans live. Right. Most people in the modern 
Western industrial world, actually. But I think America really has done the best job of screwing up health. <laughs> we're, we're number we're, one. We're, 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 <laughs> Um, but that's the thing is like, you know, so you have to let people know, like, I get it. What I'm asking you to do is, is like anathema to your being, because I'm asking you to give up your culture, which isn't totally true, right? That you can absolutely live in this culture and live in a healthful, vibrant way. And I think the counterculture, the group that is counterculture is growing so quickly. Yes. All you have to do is be like on a TikTok account or an Instagram account. And you can see like, everyone's talking about health and wellness, or maybe that's my side of TikTok. I don't know, but <laughs> my brain. But like, but even like the people who are in their you know 20s and teens are talking about nutritional supplements and organic foods. And this is now something that's more common, whereas 10 years ago, that wasn't the case. So I do see a cultural shift happening. So you just want everyone to get on the bus, get on the bus, get all on the it. kids are there and we're doing the healthy things. I love it. I love it. I love it. And so, you know, this is where one of the cool things here is that the Metabolic Training Institute of Health um, and Epidemic Answers community, we really look at a range of variables related to health creation and disease ma manifestation in a very similar way. So in your work, you really do the same. And we'll dive into some of the studies you've done and talk a little bit more about the, the two books that you've uh, put out into the world. But can you share your perspective on how a comprehensive understanding of these variables, what I would liken to the terrain, how they can guide an individual, how they can guide a family to being more proactive and more preventative in their approach to their own health or that of their family or that of their community. Yeah, I think the um, I love the the terrain concept. That's very much in, a, in all alignment with everything that we talk about and we teach. We use the term total load when we talk about yes. kids in particular. And this is a term that Patricia Lemmer, who's a mentor of mine, um, and she wrote, she's written a number of books on autism. She's really sort of just so brilliant about this stuff. But she she applied the term total load, which isn't new. You know, it was used by Bill Ray and environmental health people for decades, talking about allostatic load is a medical community's term, but talking about how in our lives we have stressors, things that stress our health. And these would be things that, you know, might be toxins or they might be emotional stressors or they could be even things like blue light or, you know, um, EMS could be another stressor. Anything that causes stress on the body and requires the body to use resources, nutrients, et cetera. Yeah. And in the modern world, there's too many of them. There's yeah. just too many stressors. Human beings are resilient and we're designed to be able to tolerate stress and stressors, but not to the degree that we have designed our lives today. We have so many health stressors. And the other part of the equation is there's not enough health support. So there's things that you can do to build your resilience, right? Like you can be out in nature or walking barefoot, getting sun, as much sunlight as possible. You can be eating healthy, nutritious foods. You can move, you can do exercise. All these things support your health and allow you to take on more stressors. So it's like a, it's like a, a balance beam, right? So the more supports you have, the more stressors you can tolerate. But if you don't have a lot of those supports on board, and you have too many stressors, that's when you start seeing the body break down, when systems break it down. And um, with our kids, this is, the, this is the key as to why you see so many developmental issues like autism. We're now about one in 31 kids with autism right now. Why do we have so many kids with autism? Why are we seeing developmental issues as opposed to, you know, just life-threatening food allergies or just autoimmune diseases? And the reason why oh. is because these kids have a total load that's too great during critical developmental times. Yeah. So when you have a total load, too great when the, um, the eyes are developing and the brain are developing vision, when you're developing auditory processing, when you're developing uh, a way to process sensory input, that's when things go awry. And that's when you get developmental conditions, neurobehavioral conditions. So it's the total load of environmental factors in modern living that's causing this epidemic, particularly developmental conditions. It's so interesting because what happens in my world, because if I work with, you know, oncology, I, I get, you know, if I present, let's say at a conference and I'm talking about all the different drops in the bucket of the terrain that affect that total load, as you allude to it, as you, as you qualify it, what I'll get is I'll talk about mental, emotional stress and, you know, traumas a little bit. And I'll have, I'll invariably have someone in the audience who will pull me aside later, basically angry and yelling at me of how is it that you're telling me that stress or trauma, it could be why my two-year-old has a very aggressive leukemia or brain tumor. And it's, it's like people forget that we incubate mm. in a generational soup. 
as well. And there was something I ran across, um, the developmental origins of health and disease, the DOHAD is what they call it. And this is the quote that they use. The concept of developmental origins of health and disease reminds us that the health of future genera generations can be influenced by environmental exposures. You've already alluded to this when they've popped out or, you know, like when they're incubating in the, in the womb, but these critical periods of development, including those that occurred in their grandmother's womb. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. it no. starts long before they've joined us on this plane and, and people forget, they just think, well, geez, my kid hasn't been exposed, but your kid has been exposed. They were exposed to your total load and your mother's total load and your grandmother's total load, as well as the traumas and the stressors of those generational traumas that came through that are impacting the expression of illness or disease, impacting ability to be resilient, impacting ability to overcome. And so I think that that's, that's a piece here that I think you, you spoke to so beautifully about this total load, but it starts long before that child is even in your womb. It starts several generations up. Yeah, there's no doubt that this epidemic is multi-generational. There's a couple of concrete ways you can understand that, like really concrete physical ways. And then there's more kind of like science has yet to elucidate exactly how it's happening pieces. But Think about antibiotics as an example. We didn't have antibiotics until the 1935 with the sulfa drugs. And then World War II comes around and they're all of a sudden we're mass producing them after World War II. And all of a sudden they're the miracle drug. And everyone loves antibiotics because they really truly did save people from dying from tuberculosis and all kinds of other things. So um, we overused antibiotics from the day they were available, right? So that means if you think back, you know, 1935, my grandmother had antibiotics and she was pregnant with my mom and had my mom had antibiotics. And so that affected my grandmother's microbiome, my mother's microbiome. I had antibiotics affected my microbiomes. There's three generations right there in a really concrete and tangible link. You can see how we have destroyed the human microbiome. And um, it's it, there's evidence of it. You could document it, you know. But there's other things that we don't quite understand, sort of like the trauma thing you mentioned. And we're just learning about the epigenetics of trauma. Now science is beginning to say, oh, yes, no, trauma can be handed down. We just learned that like a decade ago or however, not even that long ago. Um, so we still have yet to even understand the multi-generational impacts of, of all these stressors. And you have to think about it as like, I, again, I was my background is as a historian. So I always take a long view. Right. So I want to know what happened that, you know, how are we living differently today than we were 75 years ago or 100 years ago? Because that's yes. where the key is. People didn't have these conditions 100 years ago. What's different? And that's to me yeah. where the answer is. You know, that's so, I love that you brought up because I, I heard you speak to this thing about the antibiotics on another podcast that you did. But it also makes me think about you know, the other things, like you said, like the, the, the things we brought on to modern, our modern world to make our lives better. So again, these were all things that came along out of goodness, someone else's vision, mission and vision to change outcomes. So the idea of antibiotics, the lifesaver, because prior, prior to, we died of infections, right? But we also, about the time we really brought um, antibiotics and vaccines to the world, we also learned a heck of a lot more about water, you know, say, like cleanliness of water and, and hygiene that also simultaneously came along. So we can't give all credit to the, the, the you know, kind of the big pharma side of things. But, but ultimately, we did start to change some things that were major gifts to humanity. But like you said, overdone. Well, the same goes for DES, which is a type of hormone that was given to women in the 1940s and 50s. Basically, if you were a woman who birthed a child before 1960, you likely were put on a drug that you weren't even aware you were put on, yeah. which was in a good effort, an attempt to prevent miscarriage. Right. Okay. So again, this was a drug, like talk about a life scene, like what a powerful tool. Like there are so many babies that are here today because they weren't miscarried by a mom who had perpetual miscarriage issues. And yet the downstream effect of that is what we learned is the next generation of that DES um, mother, her child had a higher rate of vulvar vaginal cancer. Mm -hmm. And then the generation after that had a higher rate of prostate cancer and breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And now we're into the next generation that is showing other propensities of neuroendocrine endocrine disruption that started the moment that grandmother or great grandmother took that well-meaning medication. So that, and then the example of glyphosate, which we're living in a 
absolute yeah. experiment on that and how that's completely changing our endocrine system, our microbiome, the whole bit. And so these were things we brought. We're like, we're going to feed the world. So let's bring mm-hmm. on glyphosate to do that. This was by well-meaning, hardworking, heart-centered human beings. They're not the devil. Right. But the thing is, is once we do know, like we know for all these things, we have to do better. And right. that's where we, that's where we are in trouble. And that's where people like you, Epidemic Answers, the, the flight study, the CHIRP study that I want you to talk about, um, the books you've written, especially the one, You're a Compromised Generation. These are the things that you're trying to highlight to people of, here's the issue. We didn't know, we didn't know until we know, but now mm-hmm. we have to do better. So how do you start that conversation of where do you begin? Mm-hmm. help people know and do better. Yeah. I, I mean, I, it's um, about your study or your books, but, but t- take us there. Yeah. I, I think it is a very overwhelming. If, the, if you're new to the idea that the way you're living, just your everyday living, you know, what you're having for breakfast and what you're putting on in the shower, like if that stuff is toxic to you and that, and that's new to you, it can be very overwhelming because if you're like, all right, well, my shampoo is toxic. So it's toxic. My ta- toothbrush is to- my tampons, my what, deodorant. Like you, it just yeah. goes on and on and on. Then you start learning and you're overwhelming. And then you're like, I can't eat anything. And um, I, we had this lecture mm-hmm. at our conference last year where um, one of the, one of the uh, speakers basically talked about all the dangerous things that are in modern food, getting down to like linoleic acid and vegetable oils. And, you know, obviously the, the refined sugars and just went on and on and on. And then basically at the end of the, the end of the, um, you know, list of things that he'd gone through that you can't eat. Somebody in the audience was like, so you can have beef and air. Awesome. And, you know, <laughs> it's, but even how- both of those can be highly toxic. So nope, <laughs> you just have to be nothing. <laughs> oh. right. But that's, but that's the feeling, right? Is you just feel overwhelmed. Yeah. Like oh, I might as well give up because I can't actually do this. And the way yeah. I respond to that is actually, Again, take the long view, like think about your great grandparents and think about people who did have long lives and did have vibrant lives um, by living in sync with nature and just being um, respectful of and having honor for those rhythms that have developed over millennia. So if you have to decide like, all right, I have to make decisions about what I'm going to eat, what I'm going to put on my skin and what I'm going to do every day. And if you can lean towards the nature side to the way that your grandmother did it a hundred years ago, lean that way, you're going to do better. So you have two shampoos in the store to buy but for the one with the, le- the least ingredients, right? I mean, there's lots of tools, you know, you know, the tools, the, you know, skin deep database and made safe. And there's tons of tools today that there weren't even 10 years ago to help right. you navigate making those consumer decisions. But at the end of the day, if you don't want to check your app, when you buy your toothpaste, just buy the thing that is closest to nature. And avoid mm-hmm. things that are new to nature. To your very good point about glyphosate and DES and all these things that are like miracles and we're going to save the world and they're all with good intentions, but it's new to nature. So proceed with caution. That's just the kind of guiding principle that I think makes it easier and less overwhelming. And, and there's so many things that you can you know, use as substitutes for that still allow you to live in the modern world. You don't have to like not clean your house. You just use right. bigger, like instead of you know, yeah. whatever scrubbing bubbles you might have been using before. I love you. I love you. And, you know, you, one of the cool things, because you just sort of talked about resources, tools, and making, you know, if you, if, if this or this, choose this, you know, like the simple, not, you know, like we kind of liken it to the, here's the gold standard, here's the silver, and here's the bronze medal. And so folks can easily just get on that podium, even with simple changes, or go work depending on your your personality, your your pocketbook, your demographic that, you know, maybe you can get it all the way to that gold standard, but most people on our planet cannot. And so doing better is great and looking for the free or very, very low cost resources even better. And so one of the things you at, at um, Epidemic Answers really emphasizes is this community-based collaborative care approach. And so how you are getting communities to play a crucial role in addressing these disparities, um, you know, in the context of childhood development and in prevention and treatment of conditions. Can you tell us a little bit about what that looks like? Yeah. So one of the things that um, we learned and we have learned over the last 15 years of documenting stories of kids who've overcome all kinds of conditions is that it usually happens in a community setting where you have a motivated parent or set of parents going out and seeking resources and solutions within their community. So 
they might find um, an integrative physician or naturopath or some other kind of holistic practitioner, and they might find a dietitian or a health coach, and then they might get a therapy that they heard about that would be helpful for their child's sensory issue or whatever. So they're like going into and picking the resources in their community. And what we're hoping to see more of happen is the collaboration between those types of clinicians, because truly kids with very complex conditions like autism or something like pans pandas, which is, you know, mm-hmm. autoimmune encephalitis, basically, those are complex conditions and it takes a team and it takes a village. So there's a team or a village of clinicians that know how to do that work and they do better when they're collaborating. And sometimes the parent is like the quarterback for that. And yeah. you can get them all to collaborate if you're the, the point person and you, you lead the charge on that. But more importantly, that healing really happens in a community setting where that parent or that set of parents feel supported by friends or family, or they're going through it with another couple or another parent, another family that's doing the same thing. So you see a lot of this actually happening on Facebook, which isn't my favorite place for it to see this happening, but it is an absolutely critical and necessary part of the healing journey where you as a parent are like, okay, there's all kinds of things out of balance for my kid. I'm going to make some changes to set this straight. I'm going to get my kid healthy again. And I'm going to need some other parents who are doing the same thing. So I don't feel like a, like an outlier. I don't feel like I'm out here on my island. I need to know that other people are doing this. They're cool. We're all good. So you have to kind of find those people. You can find it in real life in your community. Sometimes you find them in the offices of these holistic practitioners. I did that. I made friends. And I was like, hey, what are you doing? Are you doing the body ecology diet too? You know, you have those kinds of conversations with people. But um, the, the, the online is really, you know, obviously most feasible and it's happening very quickly. And so if people have formed these Facebook groups to help support each other. Epidemic Answers um, knew that this was a fundamental part of the healing journey. So we just launched last year an online community called Healing Together. And that yes. is basically a member, a private membership community where parents can come in. Doesn't matter the diagnosis, but we are there. We have a couple of health coaches and a couple of integrative physicians who take live Zoom calls a couple times a month to answer your questions. So we, we get these parents who come on. They're awesome parents, by the way. I just feel privileged and honored to talk to them every month because they come in, they've done their homework, they're, they're busting their tails for their kids, they're doing amazing work, and they're just coming in and they're looking for like, I don't really understand the difference between magnesium citrate and magnesium glycinate. Which should I take? And we can help clarify those questions. And then you have parents who say, oh, well, I took magnesium citrate and this is what happened with my child. And so you have these shared, you have this sharing of knowledge, you have this support and this sort of just loving space Mm -hmm. for us all to do this together. Because to me, the most important part is that you do not feel alone because you can feel so alone when you're doing something again, that goes against your culture. So that is, um, you know, something we're going to, we're going to continue to grow. We, We built that community so that it would grow large and so that we can invite more people into it. Um, yeah. And we designed our, um, we have an intervention study that you mentioned called the flight study. Yeah. And we designed it um, so that we could actually study how that cross disciplinary or transdisciplinary collaboration actually happens in a real life community based setting. So we're studying it in real time. And um, okay. it's interesting to see how clinicians um, don't know about each other's types of practices. Like we, we, are, we tend to be in our silos because we dedicate so much time and, and resources to our training. Mm-hmm. But when they share their trainings, like, you, you know, if you get like a nutritionist who also um, connects with a occupational therapist who, who does um, Moscatova, which is reflex integration, they have so much right. to learn from each other, but they didn't get the training of the other person. So Beautiful. that to me is something I hope to see more of. And we're trying to develop that more through our flight study. Amazing. And in your flight study right now, is this the study you were telling me that you may be branching out to try and bring in more participants into this study? Because it's, I mean, this is where you are, you are taking people deep, deep Mm -hmm. dives into all the things that could be contributing to their total load, deep dive, a testing evaluation, then uh, a, a translation of what all that data means, and eventually publication of this, you're looking at um, going a little more horizontal than just deeply vertical on that to bring in more more of these youngsters to help collect that data and get action happening sooner than later. Because as you mentioned before we started recording, as powerful as this information is to really look at the depths and breadths of depth and breadth of what is causing harm or that causing the worst of the total load, um, it's like watching paint dry. You mm-hmm. said it takes it's just so Time, it just takes forever to finally get this, you know, information. And so um, I'm excited to hear that may be expanding and something's yeah. a little more scalable. Is that where you, what you, was that the right word? 
Yeah. So the the flight study, um, which stands for Facilitated Longitudinal Intensive Investigation of Genuine Health Transformation, that is a big, long acronym that basically <laughs> says that we are trying to study, again, like I said, how healing happens in a real life community based setting, but we're facilitating it and we're also studying it. So that requires us to take a family who has a child with a diagnosis and um, give them lots of tests, lots of clinical assessments and lots of um, lab tests to see where they are at baseline, Mm -hmm. watch them and help them as they go through their journey. Again, a journey is going to take a while. It doesn't happen overnight. Um, and then we're going to document what happens as they go to work with a nutritionist, as they go and get their functional labs done and they take um, supplements and they change their diet and they take the mold out of their home and they do all these things to try and reduce the stressors and increase the supports. And we take labs and assessments at intervals to yeah. track progress. So we've had yeah. two children enrolled in the study. One um, had, uh, has autism and one uh, has alopecia universalis, which is an autoimmune disease with no hair on his body. So we've had... Um, such an interesting time working with these families, um, going deep, as you said, but we're in reflecting on this study, it is not fast enough in my mind to get the help to the people that need it right away. So we're right. reflecting now on revising the protocol of the study so that we can serve more children in a, um, a simpler way. So we don't have to do as deep or we're from the first two families. We've already learned like what labs are really super relevant and which ones we don't necessarily aren't going to yes. be serving the, the children. We also have as part of the flight study. And I think this is super helpful. We use the CHIRP study as a way of assessing what's going on with a child. So the CHIRP study is um, a separate study that has over a thousand questions that a parent sit down and fill that fills out online in a secure HIPAA compliant environment. It takes about four hours to finish it. It's a massive survey. Awesome. But all those things you mentioned before about like multi-generational impacts, we ask questions about like, was grandma a victim of racism or was she exposed to trauma in a warlike setting? Like going all the way back that way. And then we go all the way through to the, you know, preconception, prenatal, neonatal, right up to what the child's watching on TV every day. Mm-hmm. You know, like anything that you can imagine that might influence your health in a positive or negative way. We tried to ask those questions. So mm-hmm. we're learning a ton through that study as well. We've had about 500 people complete it um, and over 2,000 enroll. But that um, survey, actually, um, everybody who participates in it gets their own personalized report back. And that yeah. report flags like an orange all yeah. of the stressors in your child's life. So if you're like, remember we were talking before, like, how do you start? Like, how do you feel like you feel overwhelmed? This report actually is like a blueprint. And it's like, okay, you got to change the laundry detergent. Okay, yeah. you got to um, turn the Wi-Fi off at night. Like, it tells you all the things that are stressing your child, potentially stressing your child's body. Um, and that's one way for us to try and, again, bring this out to more people because anybody can take the CHIRP right. study. A survey and anybody can get that report and get started on taking the stressors out based on what's in the report. Now, one caveat is we're moving the, the CHIRP survey to a new software platform. So it's not live this moment, yeah. but it will be soon. And anyone who goes to our website, um, gets on our email list, we'll get a notification when it's live again. But again, we're right. just trying to get, you know, what we know about the environment and how modifications can help our kids health. Um, we want to get that information out to as many people as possible. And, um, Expanding the flight study, we think will help do that as well. I love it. Well, what's really cool is that for people who know us at MTIH, this, what you just described, will sound very familiar because our process, our methodology, so it's like an oversoul to yours and yours to ours. And Mm so we've actually talked about historically how perhaps um, our data platform and your data could all be married because we're looking and asking the same thing. Our mm-hmm. intake process is 54 pages with thousands of questions. Mm-hmm. Um, our Terrain 10 uh, evaluation is is uh, way more expanded now than what's in the book. Our The same type of thing is we kind of know what the fundamental labs, after, I mean, of course, we'd love for everybody to get the deepest dive from mm-hmm. the get-go, but you really know in between time and financials what are the most critical? So we, like you, in parallel, as we described at the beginning of this, have mm-hmm. kind of found of how can we start to scale this to folks who are just curious to take like the first level look, and then those who go, okay, I'm, I, I'm my curiosity is peaked. I got enough benefit from this little bit of information that I'm ready to go deeper. Then it's the introduction. My tendency is to say. 
let's here take a nice sip of water out of this fire hydrant and do it all up front. That's how my brain and body work, but it's clearly overwhelming for the vast majority to your point. And so I like that you're rethinking it as are we, and maybe continuing conversations of how our worlds can collide in an even more integrative, meaningful way, because we do have a lot of the adults and more and more PD, you know, pediatric patients that are coming to us with the same type of concerns that are coming to you guys and to explore those together. I heard recently when I was interviewing possibly Dr. Lynn Patrick, that there were a couple surprising findings that were sort of your highest factors contributing to the dis-ease of the patient population um, that you see. Are you willing to share, are you able to share what that, the preliminary findings or maybe like the top three concerns that we should all probably be taking, you know, heeding mm-hmm. that information? Yeah, so um, we've looked at, again, we've had 500 completed surveys, and the way that we have been analyzing the, the data thus far, and imagine, you know, a database with, you know, 500 times 1,000 questions, like enormous number of data points. So what do you do with all that information, right? Exactly. You kind of have to look for signal in the noise in some ways. But our um, data analyst and um, our former principal investigator came up with this brilliant method of analyzing the data where they combine like stressors into indices, So as an example, um, we have an antibiotics index, which looks at all the exposures of antibiotics combined into one index. So it goes back and looks like, you know, your mom had them prenatally and then baby had them, you know, at zero to three and the baby had them at one and so on. That that becomes all combined into one index. You can pair that index against other measures like health outcomes. You know, like we've also created an illness index, not just... Um, you know, do you have a diagnosis? How severe is it? Is like, how much is that diagnosis diagnosis impacting your daily life? So there are ways of making it much richer in its meaning by creating these indices. So some of the, so as far as the most impactful indices, what are the indices that are showing up across diagnostic categories as the most meaningful in terms of contributing, we think, to these diagnoses? The number one index was antibiotics across every diagnostic category. That's why I keep talking about it. So, and it's where I started too. Like, I'm not surprised because I just feel I've, I've, I always knew how impactful it was to alter the microbiome, but this yeah. data is now really reinforcing that in a meaningful way because it isn't just autism. It, it isn't just life-threatening food allergies. It's, you know, mental health conditions. It's anxiety. It's depression. Antibiotics are across the board, the most important one. After that, the other ones are chemical exposures, which isn't mm. very surprising. Again, we have an index of chemical harmful chemical exposures. We have an index of sugar intake. Mm, that's, in the top five. that's in the top five. Wow. Which shouldn't surprise you at all. Yep, yep. Um, what is What was surprising to us in terms of its signal and the noise and how much it did show up in the data was um, EMF exposures. Woo. Like we didn't think we'd see that one even like in the top 10. We know it's a problem. There's all kinds of research wow. showing how it imba- impacts the body, you know, on a cellular level, EMF, EMR, like there's all kinds, cell phones, wireless, um, you know, the cell tower that they're trying to build at the elementary school behind my house, like all the things that come in this new electric world. Mm. That's a major stressor that I think we need to give more attention to than we are. Wow. So huge. Um, wow. There, I mean, my, my wheels are turning on this because... I mean, that's compelling. Those are things. And so with that knowledge, given your emphasis on, of course, awareness and prevention, what advice would you give to an individual who's just looking to maybe optimize their household a little bit, whether they've got a kid who's actively um, dealing with a chronic ailment, or they're just trying to prevent it or do the best they can to give their kid a running start, or even themselves maybe in preconception care, which mm-hmm. is something I think I really needs to be uh, brought into the medical field more forcefully. I've seen, I've seen that starting to trickle in, but we definitely need a lot more conversations before we conceive um, versus mm-hmm. cleaning up after conception. So what, where do people start with this? Mm-hmm. I mean, if you're thinking about your home and making your home a healthier Haven, you know, the, the, the Wi-Fi EMF thing is tricky depending on where you live. Like if you live in an apartment, it's very hard to mitigate that because you can open up your, your network and you can see 15, 20 people's Wi-Fi's like, that's really hard. So, um, you know, if you, 
can't mitigate that, you know, I would minimize the exposures to the best of your ability by not having any devices, any smart appliances. Um, there's a little, I wish I had it with me right now. I have it downstairs. There's a little meter I have. There's one called the Trifield, or you can get one called the Coronet. And you can, yes. you can measure EMF in your own home. They're not very expensive. Um, and you can go around and be like, all right, um, is my washing machine or my dishwasher putting out in, a, an electromagnetic radiation signal? Mm-hmm. And you can take this meter and you can determine whether it is. I don't buy smart devices. Like that's, that's one thing. And everything is smart right now. So you have to be really careful about it. Yeah. Um, you know, other things in the home, you can unplug your Wi-Fi at night if you need, yeah. if you only have Wi-Fi. Lots of people um, you have talked about hardwiring. That's a project. And I would highly recommend it if you want to do the project and put the money in. But most people can't. Right. So minimize by unplugging the Wi-Fi at night or even better getting like one of those timers, one of those appliance timers that, that turns off, turns off automatically. Then you don't have to set it, you set it and forget it. You don't have to think about it. Right. So that's, you know, that's one thing that you can do. Um, the other thing is just products, just Mm -hmm. clean up the products. Like don't buy any, like this is, this is like so American, right? We are, we are so indoctrinated in like that like needing all of these products for her skin, for hair. I remember being a teenager and walking into CVS and going down the cosmetics aisle and being like, <gasps> just yes. literally getting like a dopamine hit walking through the aisle because I had been indoctrinated by what I'd seen on TV about like Neutrogena this or like you know, Herbal Essence this, like the brands, they, they indoctrinate right. you to make you think you're going to feel good when you right. have this. <laughs> So like, we need to like really fight that and just get rid of the products and go to the basics. And the, my favorite company for helping you evaluate what products yes. are good is Made Safe. It's MadeSafe.org. Yes. And And um, that company basically goes through and does lab testing to make sure there's no harmful chemicals in your deodorant, in your toothpaste, in your shampoo, in your laundry detergent. So like, if I don't know what to buy, I just go to Made Safe. There is another database, which is the Environmental Working Group Skin Deep ba- Database. Yes. They're not as rigorous in their testing, but they have a broader database of products. So if you walk into Target, you're going to see the stuff in the Skin Deep database because that, that that is also in Target. So those That's are true. like, you know, my top two things would be like, get rid of all the products that are toxic, bring in, you know, the, the simpler, more natural products if you're going to do that. And then, you know, minimize your, minimize your Wi-Fi. Last thing I will say, especially yeah. for kids, because this is a battle. I gave a lecture a couple of weeks ago at a company. And um, I was talking about what I just talked about with you, the, the indices and the sugar index. And um, in the Q&A portion, there, one of the parents was like, I don't know how to do it. My kids are absolutely addicted. I'm addicted. We're all addicted. What do we do? And that is really, really hard. But I'll tell you, it is so meaningful. I know this is such a cornerstone of your work too, Nisha. It is so, so meaningful for you to work on getting that sugar out because um, I just have seen so many stories of kids, families who've done it and it's changed their lives. I have a very good friend and neighbor whose family, um, suddenly not too long ago, their, their nine-year-old son was diagnosed with type one diabetes and this family, the entire family has, was, um, all three children were on, on ADHD meds, um, wow. really struggling with behavioral stuff and learning and all kinds of stuff, just struggling. So when that third child was diagnosed, again, the, the, the whole family, the kids are like nine, 11, 13. They decided wow. we're going to go keto. We're going to take all the sugar out and for, for their son to manage their youngest son's blood sugars. And in doing that, the entire family got rid of all the sugar, got all of their blood sugars in range, and all three of those kids lost their ADHD diagnoses. And like just all the issues that were there before, poof, gone, just with a diet change. You know, and it's not always that simple. It isn't always just about sort of the metabolic piece. Right. But it is so powerful. And like, if you especially have a child who has behavioral issues, who wakes up cranky or moody or like can't focus and is zipping around, like that is such a game changer. Yeah. So I feel like that's another one that people really have to focus on. And, in, and today there's so many more ways to tackle this. And there were even 10 years ago, there's a million blogs out there teaching you how to, you know, change your diet and do low carb or low sugar or whole foods, you know, and and, and, and cooking from scratch. I mean, there's so many resources out there and people doing it. So, right. so worth it. So worth it. Amazing. And, you know, you just hearing that story you just shared, it's like, this is, this isn't just one, it, this one child that might be expressing this condition in your home. It's, a, it's the whole home. It's the whole mm-hmm 
enchilada that has to, to go along for the ride here. And so you support that one kiddo by joining in on their endeavor. You support yourself. Everybody benefits from this. So it's such a powerful ripple. It's not just a one-to-one, it's a one-to-many yeah. approach. I think that's so incredible of what you're doing, Beth. Just so, so incredible. And when I think about this, I want to just like give you the a moment if there's anything else you feel like you want to share that you're excited about in this moment of a project you're working on, or perhaps something you see on the horizon or, or a wish you have, or a blessing you have for all of us on what, 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 what's on the horizon for hope and all of this. Is there anything you'd like to share? Yeah. You know, we were talking about community a a moment ago. I have always known the importance of community. I've, I've Mm -hmm. seen it, I've watched it, I've documented it, but it's sort of been like in micro ways. Um, we had a uh, conference in November of mm-hmm. last year, and we're going to do it again in November in Orlando. And there was nothing like getting the people who were on our email list, in our healing community, on our Facebook pages. Like there was nothing like getting all those people in person. I have never like received and given so many hugs. I mean, it was everybody was so happy there. I mean, I couldn't even believe just this incredible intense, happy, grateful group of people that were just like, oh my God, we're all doing this for our kids. And like, there was, in, there was a sense of like, not just like, I'm here to heal my kid and to learn what we're like, some, you know, different strategies and tips and ideas. It was more like, we get it. We see what's happening to this generation Ooh. of kids and we're working on our kids. That, I'm doing that first. And then we're going to go for the rest of them. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, we're like putting the arms around, circling the rag- wagons Ooh. around the babies because the, the babies are hurting. And it was just so wonderful to be part of that community in the physical sense. Mm-hmm. Like I cannot tell you how, how um, nourishing it was for my soul. And mm-hmm. I'm really excited to do it again this year. Just getting the people together in one physical space is incredible. So that's November 15th through 17th is when we're doing that. Perfect. We've already got the dates. We'll make sure we put that in the link. I already, we even have Dr. Shalise Pratt was one of your lecturers. who's also from our network. We have a lot of cross pollination. Dr. Michelle Perro is someone I know you've had uh, connections with in the past. There's so many people here that cross pollinate our worlds that uh, bring meaning and support to our community as well as yours. And I agree that that connection in person is so powerful. And especially the last few years where we're kind of, human connection hungry. Mm -hmm. Um, It's even more important than ever. And it really does show that that is a critical part of our own healing and our own um, manifestation or impact on change. And so I Mm -hmm. love that you shared that with us. And I really hope that there are even larger numbers of people coming in droves to learn from you and share with your amazing community. I know our community will be there in full force and full support next year as well. Yeah. Um, and actually, Shalise, I think, I think will be speaking. I haven't confirmed with her, but Shalise Pratt hopefully will be one of the speakers too. So, so stinking brilliant. Like there's so many people, like there's so many girl, great, great people out there who are making a difference and you are bringing them all under one roof, which is really cool. Really, really <laughs> cool. And so when I think about this sort of um, journey of intergenerational health, that's what we've been speaking about this last hour, mm-hmm. our actions today today, because we can't completely change the past, but we certainly can impact this moment. But it's the the changes we make today that will echo through the corridors of tomorrow. And our future generations depend on visionary leaders like you, Beth, and you are such a you are such a luminary in in helping show us the way forward. And I'm incredibly honored to know you and grateful for your time and your generosity of your spirit with all of us. Oh, thank you, Nisha. I feel the same way about you. So you keep shining your light bright, please. <laughs> yes. Let's do it, sister. So <laughs> thanks, Beth. I can't wait to see what, what will, when we, when we touch back in another couple of years, I can't wait to compare notes <laughs> and hopefully we'll be doing a lot more together. So thanks again, dear one. Definitely. My pleasure. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Metabolic Matters. We hope you found today's conversation insightful and empowering. As we wrap up today's episode, we want to take a moment to acknowledge the incredible team and supporters who make this podcast possible. First, we'd like to thank our production team, Alex Sanchez, Cindy Kennedy, Jessica Gilman, and Lynn Hughes for their hard work behind the scenes. 
Our theme song was written by Julie Newmark and performed by Whiskey Flower. And finally, we want to thank you, our listeners, for tuning in and being a part of the Metabolic Matters community. Do you want to learn more? Please visit our website, metabolicmatters.org, and you can follow us on Instagram. If you liked this episode, please leave us a review and share it with your friends and family. And if you want to help support our mission, spreading awareness and knowledge about metabolic health, reach out. We'd love you to join with us. Also, don't forget to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell to stay updated on upcoming episodes. We have so much exciting content coming your way. Until next time, stay curious, stay empowered, and remember, your metabolic health matters.